Hello and welcome to PhD Watch. This is the series where I'm going to be talking about my PhD in Theoretical Atmospheric Physics at the University of Exeter. And in this first episode, I'm going to talk about the fact that, oh god, everything's changed! We've seen some dramatic scenes, um, I say we, I mean I, uh, in my PhD recently. Here's actual footage from the inside of my PhD showing what it's been like. Watch out! You had to think of a PhD as being like, your supervisor's telling you where to go. Say so your supervisor has told you to go to Hawaii, and I'm in the UK, and you talk to your supervisor and you go, okay, well, um, why don't you just go over the top of Canada? And you go through the ice there, and, and then you go round and down. The supervisor goes, yeah, that makes sense, okay. And then, go on, go off. So you do that, and then you run into the ice, and you get stuck. And you realise that the ice is a lot harder than you thought it was, and your ship maybe isn't quite as strong as you thought it was. You keep plugging away, and plugging away, and plugging away, and then eventually your second supervisor comes up to you on deck and goes, What are you doing? Why don't you just go through this canal? Like, you know, in the middle of the Americas? And then just go along through, and you go, why didn't my supervisor tell me that in the first place? Now that's that's simplifying it and I'm being mean to my first supervisor, that's not how it happened, but basically um, I'm still going to the same destination, I'm still researching the same topic, which is stratosphere-troposphere coupling and explaining how events in the middle atmosphere affect weather at the surface. Um, it's just that I'm now pursuing it via a different route, and a route that is more aligned with the mainstream um, of what other people are doing in the field, basically. What we're proposing in the first place is a new index, a new way of looking at the problem. Um, and in order to get to that new way of looking at the problem, we were also using a technique that was new. Um, basically, my second supervisor said, no, that's 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 crazy. People use this technique for a reason. The mainstream uses this other technique for a reason. Uh, so just do that, and then use that to get to your new result. Now, this represents a huge change. It means that, in effect, everything that I've done over the past sort of year and a half, um, isn't going to go into my thesis, but what it has taught me is how to do the work I'm going to do so much faster. So I learned to code uh, in Python, for example, and that's now the language that I'm coding my, my code in now. Um, it's taught me several analytical skills. It's taught me how to approach a problem, come up with an idea, test the idea, and then move forward. So I am not at all worried about the fact that a large part of my PhD isn't going into my thesis. Um, in fact, there's a a saying, at least amongst quite a few people here, which is that a PhD is like three years of training to spend six months doing a PhD. I'm curious, by the way, if you're a PhD student who's watching this, first of all, hi, um, uh, comment below if you think that's like an experience for you. I'm really, uh, being a PhD student can be kind of an isolation, uh, quite an isolating experience. I mean, yes, there's a community, small community of PhDs in your field at your university, but it's, you, that's under one set of circumstances. It's it's not across the board. And I'm always interested to hear from other PhD students. So, you know, say hi. <laughs> so this change in course that's gone um, has basically required me to overhaul everything I've done. I, I basically thrown everything I've done up until this point out of the window and I've started fresh. Over the past month, I think I've probably written about one and a half to 2,000 lines of code. Of which, uh, half of which I had to throw away <laughs> again, noticing a theme, um, and starting again. Um, basically, I'm, I'm looking at a problem called PV inversion, and I tried uh, one mathematical technique, and I did it according to the postdoc in the office with me exactly right. I'm just limited by the limitations of the hardware and the language. So with a huge amount of um, inspiration from him, and he sent me some notes over what he's done in the past, I'm now using a different technique, which is, if you're interested, it's called successive over relaxation, and that's actually now working. In fact, I got back home from the office today, despite the fact that this is Sunday and in the middle of the Easter weekend, um, and uh, it's now actually producing some sensible results. So now I just need to test that, um, and hopefully, you know, that's that's, you know, really good step forward to my thesis and presenting my work in Vienna, which is another deadline that's coming up in about 23 days, I think it is, I'm going to be presenting my work on a big stage in Vienna in front of the world's experts on stratosphere-troposphere coupling. Uh, and we already, I know I'm going to be pre presenting the idea, I just want to have some data that I've generated to go along with it. It's a really ambitious goal, but if you don't set yourself ambitious goals, you don't accomplish things that are considered ambitious. So now I'm doing dedicated videos about my PhD, I can go into a bit more depth on this. So I'm going to talk about what PNV inversion actually is. Um, you guys have often asked me to talk about more depth and research, so you asked for it. So PV is um, a, like a composite variable. It's a um, it's a quantity in the atmosphere that uh, represents the combination of your momentum equations, so basically what the wind's doing, uh, what the temperature's doing, um, and what the vertical profile in the atmosphere looks like. And the analogy that I've been thinking recently is Imagine that you're looking at a football pitch, there's a football game going on, you freeze the frame, and you 
you have the distribution of players over the over the field. You, you know, you have a set domain that you're looking at, which is the, the football pitch. You have the players and they have the ball. Now imagine if I took this picture and I erased the ball. From the distribution of the players, you can infer where the ball is. If people are turning towards, there's loads of people looking at one point, or if there's a guy running and loads of people are following him, you know that he has the ball. So the players determine where the ball is. You can think of it that way. Now in the atmosphere, this would be like saying that the ball is your potential vorticity, your PV, and the players' positions are the wind. But you can look at it from the other way. If I erase all the players and keep the ball, can I, from just the position of the ball in the football pitch, determine where the players are? And to first order, no. You'd need to know other bits of information. So say that you knew what formations the team were playing in. Say that one was playing in 4-4-2 and one was playing in 3-5-2. Given that and the distribution of the ball, you could get a pretty good guess about where each player is. It's not gonna be perfect, but you're gonna get a pretty decent guess. And that is the problem of PV inversion. That's the problem of saying, I know what the PV distribution is, what's the wind doing? So you have this quantity that has lots of information bound up in it, the position of the ball, and you're trying to extrapolate that. Well, not extrapolate that, you're trying to from that, invert that information and give you the position of all the players. That's the problem I'm looking at. And if that sounds complicated, it's because it is. So the particular problem that I'm looking at is given our PV distribution, not what, I'm not interested in what the wind's doing quite. I'm interested in what, the wind times another variable is. I don't want to go into too much detail, but it's basically, it's it's the wind times something else, which you also get from the PV. Um, and I need that to a quite a high level of precision. I need it through the entire, for the whole atmosphere from the surface to, well, we're capping it at about the upper stratosphere. Uh, beyond that point, the atmosphere is so thin that it, we don't need to really consider it. Once I have that code up and running that can take a given uh, PV distribution and translate that into this quantity which we're interested in, then we're talking. That is then a piece of code which I'm going to write again, again, and again in my thesis and in what I'm going to be presenting in Vienna. So it has to be right and it has to be accurate and quick. <laughs> At the moment, it is now working. The first requirement is that the code being right and that it runs is is ticked. Now I need to test that it's actually correct, you know, that, it, that it's accurate. Once that's down, it's actually pretty fast, so I don't need to really worry about the last bit. Once that's down, then I'm going to be spending I'm seriously considering moving a sleeping bag into the office because I'm probably going to spend an ungodly amount of time getting results out, if we can get this code working in time, um, to put into my plots uh, to, to talk at Vienna. And then as well as that at Vienna, as well as the actual science stuff, I've been invited to talk on two panels. So I'm going to be talking um, on a panel about social media and using social media to uh, broadcast science communications, talking about this kind of thing, talking about my Twitter, um, recently my Instagram. I'm at SimonOxFizz on both of those if, you're, if you haven't followed me. Why? And then as well as the social media one, I'm also going to be on a panel about filmmaking. So this exactly, um, which I'm really, really excited to do. I actually went to a panel on filmmaking two years ago and um, my knowledge in filmmaking has come along a long, long way since then. So um, I'm excited to actually kind of give back as it were, because I learned a lot in that and then sort of try to take it further and further by just making videos. That's, that's how you get good at video making. If you're looking for a tip is to make videos. Your first 50 are terrible, but then after that you start to get kind of all right. I think that's probably enough to be getting on with for one video. Um, if you like the format of me just talking about my research, if you're a, P a PhD file, uh, then comment below if you're a PhD student yourself. Please, please say hi and um, link to your Twitter or whatever and I'll follow you. Um, really looking forward to meeting some of you guys. Um, and if you're going to um, a EGU, actually comment below because, you know, maybe we could organize, if there's loads of people, I'd love to organize a meetup and we can all meet each other IRL. And if you guys would like to hear more about PV and um, how you go about inverting it and maybe actually looking at the maths, um, I'm thinking of doing a video on that. If you'd like to see that, again, comment below. It seems like all I do in these videos is tell you to comment. Sorry, you can do what you want, but I, you know, if you'd like to comment, that would help me. Um, and yeah, I, I can make that video, which I, I'd be quite keen on doing personally. Thanks for watching. If you like this, I'll do more, and if you're a researcher, may the code debugs be ever in your favour. Data indicates that the average Westerner emits 10 tonnes of CO2 per year, two and a half tonnes of which comes from their food. Mm, because as I said, I, I, I'm not used to talking about things other than the big P. Um, <laughs> so, I'm um, that line, this is got me.